Um, wanted to address the learned intermediary doctrine and the interplay between that doctrine and direct-to-consumer advertising for pharmaceutical products. Uh, there's been a, a fairly recent Supreme Court opinion that uh, Wells just referred to. This is the West Virginia Supreme Court, uh, State XRL Johnson and Johnson versus Carl. And in that case, the West Virginia Supreme Court painstakingly went through the history of the development of the learned intermediary defense and rejected it point by point, in large part due to direct-to-consumer advertising. So that case is 220 West Virginia 463, 2007. And there's another recent opinion from the District of New Mexico in 2008's federal court opinion uh, that also follows a lot of the same analysis. So to begin with, what is the learned intermediate, do learned intermediary doctrine? It's an exception in regard to the obligation of a duty to warn for prescription pharmaceuticals that says that the drug company only needs to give the warning directly to the doctor and there's no reason to warn the patient. And if you think back to, uh, someone mentioned Norman Rockwell, you know, the classic photo with the child and the doctor with the stethoscope. I really think that's pretty symbolic of the analysis and the attitude of the courts and society and, and perhaps of accurate rec uh, reflection of the times um, that there was a time when the doctor was the sole source of information on pharmaceuticals. Um, as long ago as 1925, the Eighth Circuit first suggested that the manufacturer's duty to warm is, is limited to doctors. And the early opinions actually focused a lot on privity and the lack of privity, saying, well, how can a patient come in and claim liability when the warning is going to the doctor? How can you say it's an inadequate warning? It didn't go to you in the first place. And of course, these are so long ago, it was before strict products liability. Um, that then evolved, and by 1967, the Eighth Circuit coined the phrase learned intermediary uh, to describe the doctor and the obligation of the drug company just to warn the doctor. Um, now we're obviously discussing this issue of the direct-to-consumer advertising. Um, I think it's interesting that from 1989 to uh, a fairly uh, present dollar figure, the amount spent went from 12 million to 4 billion, and Wells' information headed up to about 5 billion a year now um, for direct-to-consumer advertising. During the same time frame, um, only four additional state Supreme Courts have um, adopted the learned intermediary defense, and some courts have begun rejecting it. Uh, there's a debate, which we will get into, on how many courts or jurisdictions have actually adopted the defense. According to the West Virginia Supreme Court, it was only 22. Um, there's a lot of federal court opinions that are uh, projecting about what would the Supreme Court do. Um, but nonetheless, even if the state has adopted it, a lot of this is through common law, and the question is, is it time for this common law to change? Um, oops, here we go. Uh, I've outlined here the five major reasons that courts have adopted the learned intermediary defense and um, would like to go through them one at a time. And I think when you do that, you'll see that it really no longer makes sense. Um, the first one is that the manufacturer would have difficulty in providing warnings to the ultimate consumer. Well, obviously at this point with the, the, the billions of dollars spent on advertising, that really doesn't hold true. And we also not only get the warnings through TV and, and on um, the internet, you can get on the internet and look up drugs. Pharmacists provide warnings when you pick up your prescription. There are brochures. So to suggest that this is somehow um, an impossibility uh, or, or impractical really doesn't uh, hold true at this point. Um, the second one is that the patients are relying on their treating physician's judgment to select the appropriate drugs. And again, we saw the statistics that were just presented on how many patients go in with a preconceived notion, at least, of what drugs they want. But I would add a second point to that, which is a lot of times the doctor decides what drug they think you should have, and then the insurance company won't approve it. Or you go to fill the prescription and they switch you to a generic, which, you know, 
may not be the same. A lot of times there are differences in how generics perform. So to suggest that the doctor is actually free to exercise this independent judgment, uninfluenced by cost and um, uninfluenced by the insurance formularies, I don't think is accurate. So I think that's another level of uh, disconnect between the concept and reality. Um, the third premise is that uh, physicians exercise their professional judgment in selecting the appropriate drugs that the insurance point would hold here too. And again, we have this extensive amount of direct-to-consumer advertising. Uh, premise four, that the physicians are in the best position to give the appropriate warnings to their patients. Well, this is very problematic. You know, as you know, you go to the doctor and sometimes you're lucky to see the doctor. In fact, half the time you don't, you see the nurse practitioner. Um, the doctor zooms in the room and zooms out. Uh, if you do have something serious going on, a lot of times it's almost confusing and you, you walk, they walk out and you're like, what did they just say? I was so focused on the diagnosis, I don't even remember what you told me about the side effects, if anything. There's been surveys about how little time that doctors actually spend discussing side effects with their patients. And as you see this particular statistic, only one third of a thousand patients got any information about side effects of drugs from their doctors. So this concept that you know, you're relying on your doctor for all this information, again, it's just not holding up with reality. Um, then next, that direct warnings to the ultimate users would interfere with the doctor-patient relationship. And again, apparently there's two sides to the coin on this. Some doctors may feel pressured when people come in. Uh, but obviously, if you are an informed consumer in an informed patient, you can engage in a better dialogue and, and have more understanding of your choices. And again, I think going back to that Norman Rockwell idea, there's many, many conditions and treatments where you'll go in and the doctor will say, well, here's your choices. You can do this, you can do that. You know, if it's cancer, you can have radiation, you can have chemo, you know, they have choices for you. And you do make decisions. So this concept that the individual is just sitting there like a, like a child uh, being told what to do, it really doesn't comport with reality of medical care today. So here's my cartoon. I don't know if everybody can see it. It says, why are they advertising prescription drugs? So you can tell your doctor what you need. Too bad he wasted all that money on medical school. So, <laughs> uh, so obviously two sides to the coin. Now what's happened with the learned intermediary doctrine? And first of all, it is the exception because you're supposed to warn the consumer. So the manufacturer should be warning the consumer. Here we're saying, well, you can warn this intermediary. But several courts have started recognizing exceptions. Um, one exception is vaccines, with the logic being, well, you'll just show up at you know Walgreens or in some uh, big auditorium and they'll be vaccinating hundreds of people or giving vaccines to 100 people at a time. There's no doctor there, so they better put something in writing for you to read because they know there isn't going to be a learned intermediary often with vaccines. Um, oral contraceptives and contraceptive devices. The Code of Federal Regulations actually requires uh, what they call PPI, patient package inserts, to um, women who are getting oral contraceptives, and it also requires it for uh, anything with estrogen. So all of those drugs have an insert in there already directed to the patient, and so therefore courts have said, well, then there's an exception. You should have given a better warning directly to that patient. Um, some courts, um, particularly the Perez Court was one uh, in New Jersey that recognized that drugs advertised directly to consumers are drugs for which there should be an exception to the learned intermediary doctrine. And then over-promoted drugs and drugs that have been withdrawn from the market has also been recognized as exceptions. Um, what the West Virginia Supreme Court said, if there's that many exceptions to the exception, we just aren't interested in this doctrine. So they did not adopt the doctrine of learned intermediary. Um, I wanted to address this point, which is the proximate cause issue, because what learned intermediary comes down to in the pharmaceutical cases is, you know, you've worked up this case, you've shown that the warning wasn't adequate, there's all kinds of things that were withheld from the physicians, and you go take the doctor's deposition, and you know, a lot of doctors really want to help their patients, and, and they might even meet with you ahead of time and, and feel really bad about what happened. Uh, some other doctors probably don't care at all, and they just want to get in and out of the room, and then 
then there's some doctors who don't like lawyers, they don't like lawsuits, they think it's we against they, they're aligned with the drug companies, and, and they will have a tendency to say something like, you know, you'll say, well, there's all this information, this was all withheld, it wasn't in the label, um, and they'll say, well, I would have prescribed it anyway. Or I don't look at the labels, I, I do my own research. And you get in this position where all of a sudden this doctor can be the death knell of a litigation, even if there's very significant information that was never made known to the patient. And that's really what we're talking about here. You know, we, we get lost in abstract concepts, but we have people who've been harmed and whose lives may be changed in dramatic ways or they may have lost a, a loved one because of a problem with the drug that the patient wasn't warned about. And so we have to step back and say, well, what are the equities here and what can we really do and what can we accomplish to, to meet our goals of giving people the choice to make the right decision or to make the decision they want to make for their own safety. And I don't know about you, but I've seen plenty of these directed TV ads, um, to consumer ads on TV, and they'll get done, and my husband and I look at each other and burst out laughing and say, well, who would ever take that? You know, it's causing a million and one side effects. And that's probably a good effect of advertising, that it's making people aware that every time you take a pill, it's not a magic pill, there are consequences. So I think this idea that, well, you warn the physician, and and therefore the patient doesn't need any information, is not under the law entitled to any information. I mean, that's the effect of the learned intermediary defense. It, it really is time for a change in that defense. And um, it, it, it assumes that the patient doesn't have the right to say, well, okay, doctor, you're prescribing that, but based upon those side effects, is there something else I can do? Is there something else I can take? Can I change my diet? Can I take a different drug? So this thought that the patients will just follow along with the doctor no matter what, um, it's just really, it's not current. Um, so in conclusion, I, I think we're really looking at uh, a doctrine that's based upon a concept of a, a doctor-patient relationship that doesn't exist anymore and it, it just discounts the ability and, and I think the frequency now that people do get on the internet and look things up and people do read labels and they do become informed and th that we are more of a partner in our healthcare process and the doctor doesn't control it all anymore. You've got the insurance company in there and you have the patient in there and to um, have this set up so that there's no requirement at all under any circumstance to share information directly with the patient is very out molded. And one thing I would just add very quickly, in West Virginia, that particular case involved one where both the doctor and the drug company had been sued. And so the Supreme Court of West Virginia was saying, well, wait a minute, what this is going to do is keep the doctor liable for failing to pass on this warning that he may or may not have gotten in the first place from the drug company. And the drug company that makes all the money on the transaction gets to walk away with no responsibility. So I think it's just important to rethink some of these concepts as we move forward and, and to ask what is the harm of educating people. And with that, I'll turn it over to Bert. I don't have, okay. this is only Oh, that's slides. for, yes. Okay.